Okay. Um, well, welcome back to the second part of the first tandem of the day. Um, I'm very delighted to introduce to you our, our speaker for this um, part of the tandem. It's Oliver Freire Jr. I'm not sure if my mic is from the Universidad Federal de Bahia, Brazil. He's a full <coughs> professor of physics and the history of physics there. Uh, he's um, his main subject of interest in physics as well as history of physics is quantum physics. And he has many outstanding contributions there, mostly well known probably for his book, The Quantum Dissidents, Rebuilding the Foundations of Quantum Mechanics from 1950 to 1990. And I'm sure he will tell us much more about this himself in his talk. So let's welcome um, Professor Olival Ferre um, from Universidad de Bahia. Okay, uh, good morning. First, I would like to thank you very much to Flavio and Bernadette for organizing this uh, interesting and challenging conference and inviting me for this presentation. Second, uh, I want to say that it's an honor to chair this standard work with Dan Greenberg, because he is one of the subjects of the history I intend to present. Uh, uh, third, uh, as you can see from the uh, title of my talk, uh, I will speak uh, about a kind of prehistory of quantum information. Uh, in the sense that uh, quantum information emerges as a, a full field uh, of research uh, in the early 90s. So I want to cover uh, the conditions previous to the emergence uh, of uh, quantum foundations. Thus, uh, in a certain sense, it, also, uh, it will be also a prehistory uh, of some of the uh, questions uh, Dan Greenberg presented here because uh, indeed the GHZ Z, uh, theorem appeared in the late 80s. So uh, uh, the history of the GHZ theorem begins when my history uh, 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 ends. Uh, and third, I would say that my talk will overlap with David uh, Kaiser uh, presentation yesterday in many aspects. Aspects. I should say that I reflected yesterday if I should change or not my talk, but in the end I decided to keep as I had prepared, uh, uh, mainly because this overlap is an expression of the things I learned with David in the last 15 years we have been interacting and discussing uh, about this subject. Uh, okay. <laughs> So, uh, as you well know, uh, research on the foundations of quantum mechanics uh, entered the 21st century as a, a blossom field, uh, a field which is considered good physics, uh, normal physics, uh, mainstream physics, and, uh, uh, but furthermore, uh, it is related to the prompts of applications uh, in the uh, field of quantum information. That's the reason, for instance, that in 2010, we had this prestigious Wolf Prize in Physics uh, awarded to Klauser, Alain Speck, and Anton Zeiling for uh, their contribution uh, related to uh, experiments uh, on Bell's theorem, on Bell's uh, uh, tests uh, of Bell's inequalities, or extensions of these uh, inequalities, which includes uh, uh, the GHZ theorem uh, as one of these extensions. So from my point of view, the history of Bell theorem uh, and the, the, the history of quantum entanglement uh, encapsulates the historical changes uh, undergone by uh, research on the possibility of uh, completing or enlarging quantum mechanics to uh, the introduction of additional hidden variables. Uh, in the end of the day, our conclusion is that uh, uh, if hidden variables is to be introduced in quantum mechanics, uh, it cannot be uh, the kind of hidden variables uh, which are local hidden variables. Uh, but this is the conclusion in the end of, of, of the history. 
So, uh, from my point of view, there is a line uh, from the early discussions about uh, introducing hidden variables to the conclusion we had in the end uh, of these histories. However, it was not always that foundations of quantum mechanics and the issues uh, such as uh, uh, this, uh, about uh, hidden variables, were positively considered. Indeed, this subject once occupied a very marginal, uh, marginal position, uh, a philosophical issue beyond the pay of scientific research. Uh, we, we have seen uh, yesterday some of this uh, through David's uh, talk, uh, but uh, I can recall that in the early 50s, uh, uh, Isidore Rabi uh, said things like that, that uh, David Bond's reinterpretation of quantum mechanics was analogous to the angels which people introduced in the Middle Ages uh, to explain things. Uh, if you take the late 50s, you have a, a little better uh, consideration, but uh, Messia said things like that. Uh, hidden variables pertain to uh, the philosophy uh, of science rather than to the domain of physical science proper. Uh, in the mid-60s, I will show uh, later, uh, Bell's work was considered by Rosenfeld, a uh, waste of talent. Uh, and even in the early 70s, some physicists still wonder uh, uh, whether the experimental research with Bell theorem was real physics. Uh, so, uh, considering uh, foundational issues worth of investigation, uh, is, ki is a kind of a renaissance in the history of quantum mechanics because it's true that in the inception of quantum mechanics there were uh, heated debates uh, among the founding fathers of, of the discipline. Then these debates disappeared and then they came again. So uh, my uh, Historical question, or the question I think that requires a historical explanation, uh, is that uh, what were the factors uh, who, who, which brought foundations of quantum mechanics from the margins uh, to the mainstream of physics? That's the title of my talk. Uh, from my point of view, uh, these factors were diversified. They were not unique. Uh, and uh, they did not uh, act, these factors were not effective all on the same time, on the same place. If you want to uh, write this history, uh, you needed to disentangle uh, these uh, kinds, uh, these different kinds uh, of factors. In this short talk, uh, I, will not, uh, I will not try to, uh, to present a, a, a whole history of this in details. I just want to suggest a kind of a cartography of these factors. Uh, in fact, a list of these factors without considering their development two times. So uh, this is the list of factors uh, I want to emphasize, uh, and I will just uh, take a few ones for our consideration. Let us begin by the conceptual issues. So this is my first point I want to emphasize. Uh, we need to recognize, now it's easy to, to, to acknowledge this, that there were important conceptual issues uh, in the inception, uh, when, the, 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 when quantum mechanics was created, and some of these uh, conceptual issues were not dealt properly at the time. Uh, so one of the, 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 the question, it was exactly this question. Sometimes it appears uh, as uh, the title of hidden variables, uh, at the other times about uh, with the title of uh, if quantum mechanics is complete uh, or, or not. Uh, many times this was related to determinism, uh, other times not. Uh, but this was an important question in the inception of quantum mechanics. Uh, from my point of view, it was so important that even if Louis de Broglie abandoned this question in 1927, uh, it was not by chance that in the 30s, von Neumann, uh, when he wrote his uh, 
o monumento, o, o work about the mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics, he dedicated uh, a section to present his proof against the existence of uh, hidden variables compatible uh, with quantum mechanics. So it was not a minor question in the inception of quantum mechanics. Uh, as you know, uh, the question uh, he appeared uh, in the debates between Einstein and Bohr in 1935, I don't want to enter into details, and finally uh, it came more clear uh, in the work by Bell, Bell's theorem, in 1965. And this is the, 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 the solution. Uh, Bell was able to identify certain assumptions in Einstein's uh, reason. Uh, the first one, realism, the second one, locality, and it was, he was able to uh, translate these conceptual, these philosophical assumptions uh, in a kind of a, a mathematical expression, the, the first Bell's uh, inequality, uh, and uh, quantum mechanics uh, does not satisfy uh, these inequalities. So this is a, a Bell theorem. Quantum mechanics may, in certain cases, violate Bell's inequality. It's not in all cases, uh, because here you have uh, uh, hidden variables, quantum mechanics. You have in some parts uh, of the graphs, you have uh, divergence, but it is not in all uh, uh, positions. Now, uh, since the early 60s, uh, uh, sorry, since the early uh, 70s, uh, this was brought to the lab bench. Uh, uh, Greenberg, uh, then Daniel Greenberg uh, recalled us uh, that Michael Horn just passed away uh, recently. I didn't know, I didn't know that. And the, the, and the role of this uh, CHSH uh, paper. It was a, uh, this is a wonderful chapter in this history uh, because uh, Michael Horn was a doctor student of Abner Shimon. Klaus was already, had already a, a, a doctor training. And uh, it's also a nice history because this had everything to become a competition between Klaus and Shimon. And then, uh, inspired by Wigner, uh, Shimon decided to make a phone call to, to Klaus. And instead of competing, who was the first to understand the Bell, Bell theorem and their uh, experimental uh, implications, they decided to collaborate. And that's the origin of this wonderful uh, paper. Now, uh, this uh, experiment uh, has a full history. I don't want to enter in details here. Uh, Daniel Greenberg uh, called our attention for the role played by the new truths of entangled photons. Uh, uh, it was used by Yan uh, Hashi, uh, Mandel, Dining, uh, Nicolas Gizan, and the others. Uh, and the full conclusion of this is that entanglement was considered maybe uh, after a, a last pair uh, experiment, or maybe after Richard Fry experiment in 1976 uh, as a physical phenomenon. And then you had this last kind uh, of experiments, uh, like the experiments in the uh, Canary Island, and the very recent one when you are using uh, cosmological data to uh, have a kind of random numbers to try to uh, close uh, to, and, try, and uh, indeed uh, close at, at a certain limit uh, the loopholes uh, in this. Uh, kind of uh, experiments. So before going to the measurement problem, the second conceptual issue, I want to emphasize this. The possibility uh, 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 of competing quantum mechanics was a kind of analogy uh, with uh, the, the, the relationship between uh, classical mechanics and statistical mechanics uh, in the 19th century. Uh, so it was very common, uh, this idea, what is the the theory behind uh, quantum mechanics, which is for classical mechanics, as quantum mechanics is for statistical mechanics. So uh, this was a conceptual issue. This was not a, a minor. Uh, 
issue. And the existence of this wonderful history uh, of more than half a century of uh, theoretical developments and, exper and wonderful uh, experimental developments just show us uh, how important these conceptual issues were. Now, the second conceptual issue, uh, the measurement problem. We were discussing uh, in the break when the measurement became a problem. This is a nice question, because uh, from my point of view, this was not understood as so uh, in the inception uh, of quantum mechanics. Uh, from my point of view, uh, uh, you had in the 1930s two solutions. Uh, the solution by Niels Bohr, uh, that you needed to use uh, plain language, uh, so you need to use concepts from classical physics in order to uh, to communicate the re result of experiments. And you had the other solution by John von Neumann, uh, who identified uh, two different evolutions uh, of the quantum states. Uh, but you cannot find in the texts a, a huge debate about the quantum measurement. Uh, and it, it, you cannot find the word quantum measurement problem. Uh, indeed, as far as I know, there was a debate between Bohr and von Neumann in 1939, uh, so on the evening of the Second World War, uh, where it's clear from the proceedings of this conference in Warsaw, Warsaw uh, that uh, uh, they had a difference. Bohr was not satisfied with von Neumann's uh, presentation, but it was after the World War II that the problem uh, became more uh, uh, clear. From my point of view, uh, the, the attempts to, 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 to touch the, what we call quantum measurement problem began, began uh, in the, the, the 50s uh, because Bohr's solution was too philosophical uh, to be accepted by physicists, and the von Neumann's solution was too mathematical uh, to be accepted by the physicists. Uh, so, from my point of view, the two solutions uh, had uh, some uh, weakness. But it was indeed uh, in the 60s that the, the quantum measurement problem indeed emerged as a problem by the hands uh, of Eugene Wigner, I think that he was the, the, the main player in this history. Uh, as far as I could check, the first time the expression quantum measurement problem appeared in print, uh, it was in uh, Wigner's 1963 paper uh, exactly with the title quantum measurement problem. 1949, a paper by Jordan. Ah, I didn't know. Wonderful. Good. And I looked, I found that because I, I, I read yours. Good. <laughs> and I, I worked harder. Excellent. 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 But it, it's fantastic that during the 50s, and, and when people... There wasn't much mentioned. Yes, yes. But I, I can show you in your notes. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Now, uh, this, this problem was uh, uh, very important in the 60s uh, due to a kind of a sociological problem, if you may see. Because this conceptual problem became part of a very strong dispute between uh, the Italian physicist, Daniel Login Prosper, who presented a physical solution for the uh, measuring problem, the, the, the thermodynamical amplification uh, approach. This solution was supported by Leon Rosenfeld, uh, who in the 60s was considered a kind of, of uh, 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 the, 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 the outspoken uh, person to, to represent Bohr's point of view, who was not, no longer alive. And this solution was criticized by other physicists, uh, Ebne Shimon, uh, Michael Yanaz, uh, who were students of Wigner. And Wigner entered in, into the, in, in the debate. Uh, and it's in the late 60s that the idea of the existence of a Copenhagen school and the Princeton school uh, appeared uh, among physicists, or the idea of a clash between Wigner uh, and, the, uh, and the Italians. So this was the, I, I could talk a little bit about the, 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 the measurement problem, but I want just to say two things. Uh, Everett, relative states uh, approach, uh, even if it is not 
usually seen as a solution for the, the measurement problem. Uh, but uh, one of the strong motivations for Everett, it was that he did not accept the von Neumann's uh, presentation of two evolution for the, 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 the quantum states. So in a certain sense, we can say that uh, Everett's work was motivated by the existence uh, of the quantum measurement problem through the uh, solution uh, of uh, von Neumann's, which Everett did not, uh, Everett did not uh, accept. And the other comment I would say that uh, there is another problem related to the measurement problem, but not exactly identical to the measurement problem, which is the uh, transition from the quantum description of a system to the classical description uh, of a system. Uh, then, uh, Uh, okay, I, I'm not uh, speaking. Uh, I will not speak about the, 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 the less of this approach, but I want to uh, speak about uh, what measured as the, 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 the coherence, uh, the coherence uh, effect uh, was, in a certain sense, related to the awareness uh, of the problem that uh, you, you have a problem uh, as how can a classical description. Uh, appear uh, if you uh, take as point of the part of the uh, quantum description. So this was the work by uh, the, uh, a kind of uh, forerunner in this uh, work. Uh, by the way, he just uh, passed away uh, last year, and Leggett, Leggett and Caldera and Zurich and, and the others. Now, uh, here, yeah, this it's this iconic uh, uh, drawing uh, in the, the, the Zurich uh, paper in physics today. Uh, now, we had the other uh, conceptual issue uh, from my point of view, uh, which is the connection between quantum and gravity. To say this today, it's not uh, uh, not nothing new. It's not by chance that this uh, series of uh, uh, talks, one is dedicated to quantum foundations and the other dedicated to uh, gravitation, quantum gravitation. Uh, but what I want to emphasize is that uh, this connection, uh, or the problems related to connect uh, quantum mechanics to gravitation uh, was also a problem uh, considered by a problem early, at least early on, like 1960s. So this is the paper by Bruce DeWitt in 1967. Uh, when you can see that uh, it's a, a very important paper, part of a, a three uh, papers uh, uh, where appeared what we know we now call the the witt uh, equation, but uh, indeed the, the, this paper is ju just by uh, the witt And the, for the first time, you had this kind of thing. You had uh, a paper discussing uh, quantum theory of gravity, so it's not working, but you can see. So uh, he discussed the what he saw as an insufficiency uh, of the Copenhagen view. And uh, he suggested, or he had rediscovered uh, the Everett uh, in, uh, interpretation of the Everett approach uh, as a, a possible uh, solution for the uh, quantum treatment uh, of gravitation. So it was a kind of a, 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 a third conceptual issue, uh, which are, uh, from my point of view, on the, the roots of the uh, uh, emergence uh, of uh, the research on quantum foundations. It is, it is not by chance that Brice DeWitt, after this work, this very important work for his research, uh, he became a vocal uh, 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 advocate uh, of Everett's interpretation. He rediscovered uh, the original dissertation, uh, he used the, the word, uh, many words, and he had an important participation, I will talk uh, a little bit later. Now, I want to say that the the other roots uh, of uh, interest in quantum foundations, these are the philosophical implications and co for committing, philosophical commitments. 
this is very important for the, 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 the session we are discussing. Uh, I don't want to enter into details, but uh, what I want to say is that even if many physicists dislike the, the blend of physics uh, with philosophy and preach they shut up and calculate, uh, the fact is that uh, philosophical uh, implications, philosophical assumptions were instrumental in the history of the research of quantum foundations. And from my point of view, not, not only the realistic point of view, uh, because it's easy to, to, to say that Bohm, Bell, Einstein were realistic then, realism played a positive role in fostering the, the, the debate uh, on quantum uh, mechanics, but I would say that also an instrumentalist view also played their role. Uh, I, I always want to recall uh, on a paper a little bit for, forgotten by uh, the French physicist Paul Langevin, uh, who wrote exactly about how realism and instrumentalism have been in different circumstances driving force to develop quantum mechanics. This paper was written in the late uh, 50s or uh, early 30s. So he was thinking about Einstein and Heisenberg contributions. And uh, this paper for me is very important because Langevin was a true uh, committed realist, but he acknowledged the role of, of both uh, 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 parts, uh, 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 both kinds of uh, philosophical commitment uh, had played in the development uh, of physical theory. And I like among the main uh, example uh, of uh, 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 motivating uh, or, or, or at least uh, uh, philosophical commitment which had a, 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 a uh, which played a role in the development of quantum foundations, I like to cite uh, Roy Glauber, the pioneer of quantum optics. He said once, I don't know anything about photons, but I know one when I see one. Uh, and sometimes this appears when I detect one. This, uh, he doesn't know anything about what? I don't know anything about photons, but I know one when I see one. So. <laughs> This is typically an instrumentalist view, but this was uh, important uh, in the, his uh, way uh, to quantum optics. Now, uh, we also had uh, new techniques. I just want to say, uh, David, uh, remember that uh, even an, an experiment is not enough to, to, to convince uh, 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 the physics community uh, of the importance uh, of, of some field. And uh, I, I had a true uh, almost uh, maybe 10 to 12 years a debate with John Bromberg, a great historian of physics, because we were working on similar uh, fields, but she emphasized the idea, uh, the role of instrumentation, the role of applications, and the, our discussion was always, okay, new instrumentations, uh, like this beautiful uh, picture of IBM. So manipulation, single photons, uh, down conversion, manipulation of uh, single atoms, uh, electrons and photons and so on. Uh, this was very important, no doubt. But this played a role from the mid 80s on. You cannot see uh, this playing a very important role before. If you see, for instance, uh, uh, not uh, Alain Spé uh, 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 experiment, because Alain Spé had at least uh, the tuning laser to, to, to excite the, the, the atoms, uh, to, 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 to get the pair uh, of correlated photons. But if you take the first experiment that you show uh, the, the, the picture, uh, the technique, the, the technique was the technique of the fifties. So uh, even the pictures, if you compare this picture with the recent pictures, uh, you can make a, an experiment in quantum optics on this uh, table. And uh, uh, Klauser took 200 hours to take numbers from uh, his experiments. So. Uh, uh, 
technical improvements played a role, but uh, a role which was important later uh, from the ages on. And from the ages on, it was a very important, uh, it, it played a very important role. Uh, now, I'm going to, to uh, skip some of my parts, but I want to emphasize now the idea that uh, uh, as important as uh, these questions I presented uh, may be considered now, I would say that these foundational issues could have lain dormant for a long time, if not for the role played by the physicists who worked on them. Uh, I may give I may give you an example of an inactive issue in the history of physics, uh, which was the nature of inertia, the nature between the relationship between the gravitational and inertia, inertial masses in Newton's times. It took centuries for the question be uh, emphasized by Hans Ma and later by Einstein. So it is, it is not because you have an important conceptual issue that this question will be considered by a physics, uh, a scientific community. Uh, you need to have people who want to say, here we have good science to be done. And that's uh, the moment I want to introduce what I call uh, the quantum dissidents. Uh, so the quantum dissidents for me are the physicists who worked uh, on this field in a time where this field was not so well considered as uh, in the late maybe 20 years. Uh, now, I use this uh, uh, expression, dissidents, uh, because I think that uh, they, so it's a question, why I call them dissidents? Were they against Copenhagen interpretation? Were they against Bohr's interpretation? Most of them, yes, not all of them. The most important for me is that they challenged the common uh, wisdom or the received view at that time that foundational issues were already solved and not worth pursuing. Uh, so this idea I took from uh, uh, an early paper by Bell and Nuremberg uh, in 1966 when they wrote this kind of thing. The typical physicist feels that foundational issues have long been answered and that he will fully understand just how, if ever he can spare 20 minutes to think about it. So who are these quantum incidents? I brought here a kind of... Uh, a uh, family portrait of the quantum dissidents. That's why you are here, uh, 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 back. Uh, you have here the, the full GHZ. Uh, so I like this picture for a number of reasons. One of the reasons that uh, this happened in 1990. So it was before the explosion of quantum information, uh, when quantum foundations were uh, subject for a small number of physicists around the world. Uh, so the second is that because Bell is still alive, and we have a number of other people I like very much because uh, we have here uh, Abner Shimon in the end, a person I like very much, but also for the topic of today, the, the full GHZ theorem in this conference, this Hamhas conference. Uh, Horn, oh la la, uh, on the left, uh, driving uh, on above, and you, you are not so tall, <laughs> you can identify where you are. Uh, let me see if you, oh, but you, you can see. Okay, uh, let me say a few things about the quantum dissidents. Uh, so, these quantum incidents, they needed to face uh, prejudice against uh, the hidden variable issue and against the research uh, on foundation of quantum mechanics. Okay, so just to, to have no doubt where you are, you are here. Yeah. So here you have the G8Z. Theorem. <laughs> uh, okay, so the kind of prejudice they faced. Uh, John Bell was familiar with this kind of prejudice because uh, uh, 
so before, sorry, uh, I took this picture from the 1990s, but uh, the quantum incidents for me include, uh, obviously, Bohm, Everett, uh, Wigner, uh, uh, people who were uh, over there, uh, other people, less known people, like Mario Bunge, like Klaus Tausk, and uh, younger people like Nicolas Gizan and the others. Uh, what they had, they have in common uh, is that they, uh, they had this attitude to see, here we have good physics to be done. That's the, 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 the shared view. Uh, now, about the prejudice, I said to you that Bell uh, faced this problem early on, 1966. He was uh, already uh, a very respected uh, physicist, uh, but he had just published these two papers uh, uh, criticizing von Neumann's proof and presenting his theory. And he received this letter from Leon Rosenfeld. Uh, I need not tell you that I regard your hunting hidden par parameter as a waste of your talent. So this was the kind of uh, bias uh, that Bell was familiar. So it was not by chance that the first time uh, Alain Sper uh, went to discuss uh, 1976, uh, he went to discuss his experiments, the experiments which were published in 1981 and 82, uh, to discuss these experiments uh, with Bell. The first question uh, Bell asked Asper was not about the content of the experiment. The first question was, uh, do you have a permanent job? The fact is that Asper had a permanent job at the Ecole Normale Superior Technique in Cachan, and this made all the difference. Now, I'm talking about Alain Asper, uh, talking about Bell, but these prejudices were not so effective uh, concerning them. But concerning other physicists, these prejudices were very effective in blocking their professional career. I want to cite two examples. The first one is Klauser. Klauser, for any standard, uh, is one of the best experimental physicists in the United States. Uh, he did his PhD in Columbia uh, with Patrick Tadeus, working on microwave measurement. He did uh, his uh, wonderful work uh, with Shimon, uh, translating the theorem to, 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 to the labs. Uh, he further uh, developed Bell theorem. He replicated uh, experiments. He did the first experiments. He participated in the early debates about quantum optics, but despite all these achievements, Clauser never got a permanent job in the American University. Uh, okay, I may understand when he, the time he needed a, a permanent job, 1972, 1973, it was still the time of the uh, job crisis. You described well uh, in your talk, uh, David, but uh, I also had no doubt that Many of the people who could uh, interfere to hire uh, Klaus, they did not believe Klaus was doing good physics. So they were not asking if Klaus was a good physicist. They had doubts if what kind of if the kind of physics Klaus was doing was good physics. That's the letter we had cited, uh, which is a letter. Uh, that we know this letter because uh, uh, Bernard Espanhol received a letter from the, the, the department chairman at San Jose, uh, University of California, inquiring whether what you have been doing is real physics. Uh, so that's how we know. Uh, I have other evidence, but I do not have time to, to go. We have a second example for me. Uh, I, I have several examples of this. I don't want to, to, to uh, my time is run out. Uh, but the second I want to, to say, it's there. Uh, 
uh, Hans Dieter there. Uh, he was working on nuclear physics uh, in the late 60s when he wrote a paper which may now be considered a forerunner of the decoherence approach. The paper suggested that the ensemble of a system plus a measurement device cannot be considered a closed system. Thus, approximations are required when you use the Schrodinger equation to describe it. This idea was in other uh, minds at the time, but uh, there was the person who better described it and wrote a paper. Uh, but the same idea you can find, for instance, Fock, uh, the, the Soviet physicist, said something. Uh, Oh, the system of interest in quantum system in quantum mechanics cannot be closed systems. Now, the paper was not <coughs> accepted by you know, Timento and the uh, Naturwissenschaft. At that time, uh, their work at Heidelberg under the guidance of the Nobel Prize winner Jensen, and Jensen decided to ask Rosenfeld's advice uh, on the paper. And this was uh, Rosenfeld's letter uh, to, uh, to Jensen. Uh, it's terrible that uh, that uh, only knew this letter uh, about six years ago when the letter uh, was revealed because we discovered this letter and we asked the, uh, the, 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 the news archive, then we gave the letter to uh, that. Uh, but that felt the, that the ambience uh, around him in uh, Heidelberg had completely changed. Uh, and uh, he, it's his reminiscence that he realized at that time when uh, uh, Jensen uh, told him uh, that he could not, he, he should not uh, pursue uh, this line of research, and uh, he realized that all the colleagues at uh, the Heidelberg uh, team knew something about uh, as if he had done something wrong, but he did not know uh, the letter, and that realized at the time that his academic career was blocked. Uh, anyway, he kept uh, uh, his uh, research. Uh, later uh, in the ages, he resumed uh, this subject uh, with a student, Eric Eos, but indeed he never got a professorship in the German uh, uh, cases. Uh, now, uh, as I spoke uh, about the quantum incidents, I needed to uh, say a few words about uh, a problem of generations and change of generations. It's the reason of the question I asked you yesterday. Uh, so uh, most of these quantum incidents were young physicists when they began to work uh, uh, on the foundations. Uh, in a time, in 1950s and mid 60s, when the old guard uh, of the founding fathers uh, were retreating for the line of the philosophical battle. Uh, Bohr died in 1962 or 63. Uh, Paul had died in the, the, the late 50s. Heisenberg was alive, but he was not engaged in these debates. So there was a real change uh, of uh, generation. We can think about this. However, uh, I think that this idea of this change of generation uh, should be uh, tempered uh, by uh, an information about, uh, by the, the information that some of these young guys were supported by old physicists uh, who thought there was good physics to be done on this field. I can imagine, for instance, the support uh, Alain Specht had from Claude Cointanogy, even if following Claude Cointanogy after the experiment, uh, Bell's experiment, uh, he left the subject to another subject, but he left this to work with Claude Cointanogy. Uh, but uh, Alain Specht also said that during the, the, the late 70s, uh, the interaction with Claude Cointanogy was very important for him in France. I want to say that uh, I, I did an interview with Anton Zaling a, a few years ago, and it's clear that Helmut Hoff uh, 
uh, Roche was very instrumental in supporting uh, Dylan's uh, interest in foundation of quantum mechanics, first uh, on a neutral interferometer. There is this very uh, famous, no, famous now, uh, 1976 Elite Conference, uh, a conference that Dylan was sent because Roche could not go. And Rauch said in the conference, when he arrived there, uh, the conference was uh, organized by Bell in Erich, uh, and the subject of the discussion was uh, Bell theorems, Bell's experiments. And Dylan was not aware <laughs> of the, 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 the subject, because he went to, a young physicist, he went to present this kind of experiments with neutron uh, interferometer and, and this kind of uh, uh, the, the minus seems when you uh, uh, rotate the, the system uh, of 2 pi. Uh, and uh, furthermore, Dali was supported by Roush when he decided to change from neutral interferometer to uh, quantum optics in the late 80s. But I think that the most telling example of somebody from the old generation supporting younger generation, uh, younger physicist was Shimon, because he was very effective uh, supporting uh, uh, his young, uh, younger uh, colleagues. Uh, Shimoni, who was a student of him, uh, Yanazi, who was also a student uh, of him, Zé, who, who was not a student of him, I didn't tell this, Zé was strongly supported by uh, Wigner. It was by the hands of Wigner that the paper was eventually published in Foundation of Physics, which had just been founded, and, Rosa, uh, and, and Zé, Wigner was on the editorial board. Uh, furthermore, uh, Wigner was very important in this history because different from uh, the old guys like De Bruyne and the Einstein who were against Niels Bohr, uh, thought so they were against, they were critics uh, of what we could call a Copenhagen interpretation. Uh, uh, Wigner was completely aligned uh, with the uh, von Neumann's uh, interpretation, or von Neumann's presentation of quantum mechanics. And the clash between Wigner uh, and Rosenfeld in the 60s was also a clash into what we can call, if I use uh, Max Yammer's uh, word, was a clash into the monocracy uh, of the Copenhagen School. I said that in this case, the Copenhagen School the democracy broke from the inside. Now, I move for the parts where there are <coughs> more overlap between my talk and David talk yesterday, and that's the reason why we go uh, quicker uh, about this field. Not by chance, the three books, this slide was prepared, <laughs> uh, the, the, the two books and the, the paper by uh, Flavio Del Santo, uh, uh, let me know an uh, anecdote. Uh, I was in the interaction with uh, Flavio uh, through letters, uh, through uh, David Kaiser, but I've never met him in person. I met him uh, one and a half months ago. And I was so impressed by this paper that I had no doubt that uh, uh, Flavio was so old as me, or maybe from the older generation, somebody from the generation uh, of Baraka. So I could, it's true that Climério, who, who is a colleague from Brazil, had told me that I, I met Flavio, but I, I did not realize that he was this young guy still doing his PhD and doing in physics, and at the same time, doing these wonderful papers in... <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, uh, what I want to say. Uh, these quantum incidents, they acted, uh, influenced also, no, not only by the conceptual issues, uh, technical issues, etc., but also uh, they were influenced by some contextual factors. I don't want to, to speak about the 1950s, but this played a role. Uh, interesting as it may be, 
the criticism by Soviet uh, physicists and philosophers in the 50s against uh, Niels Bohr uh, thoughts uh, played a role in the sense that this was a kind of support for every Marxist, physicist, Marxist in the, the world, like David Bohm, like Jean-Pierre Vigier, like Mario Bung, like... Uh, uh, it's not Eisenstadt. The guy you started, you cited the... The name will come. Eisenstadt is another guy. He is alive. Uh, he was a... This guy was a Marxist physicist who wrote to defend the hidden... Fashta. So, uh, this was the, the kind of contextual factor, and this is, is interesting because uh, if it is true that you had on one side in the, the, the 1950s uh, the, the, the apex, uh, apex of Cold War, and you had the, the Zidanovism in the Soviet Union and McCarthyism in the United States, all of this blocking the free debate uh, of ideas, and you had in the Soviet Union uh, the experience uh, with the, uh, the, the prohibition of genetics. In the case of foundations of quantum mechanics, it was different because the kind of criticism the Soviet philosophers and physicists were doing uh, against Niels Bohr thoughts, it was uh, the kind of criticism that in the West, the same criticism were done by other physicists like Einstein. Uh, and this stance, uh, in spite of the fact that there were Marxist physicists on both sides of the controversy, some pro-Bohr, pro -bon, Niels Bohr, like Rosenfeld, like Falk, others uh, opposite to uh, Niels Bohr. Now, in the late, the, 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 the more interesting part is this, in the late 6th and 7th, uh, we had this kind of general change in society, uh, cultural change, very related to the uh, escalation of the Vietnam War, but not only this, uh, it was a true change of generation, change of culture, and uh, one of the consequences it was this, the, uh, in the case of the Italian uh, physical society, we have studies in the Flavio del Santo and the Baraka and the Belgium, uh, there was a true ambience uh, favorable to this kind of research. So this is the picture of the first school dedicated to foundation of quantum mechanics in Varena, 1970. I called this the Woodstock of the quantum incidents. I don't go into details, but you have here just a few, uh, okay, a few illustrations uh, uh, about the, the connections the young physicist saw at the time between foundations of quantum mechanics and the cultural uh, changes uh, uh, of the time. I like very much uh, this quotation by Toniette. I graduated with an original thesis on Golgi series, but at that time, nobody cared about it. Then, in the political context of the late 60s, we hoped for a deep change, not only in society, but even in the way of doing physics. So, we started from the foundations of quantum mechanics. Uh, which I learned from Messiaen. So this is also uh, a picture we both like very much because this is uh, uh, this is from the Times. Uh, this represents uh, the, the, the the zeitgeist uh, of the time. Uh, so pay attention, please. It's not the uh, physics war. Uh, it's the war physicists, uh, so the traditional physicists, and in his mind, you had this kind of question. It was the time, 1969, when uh, Murray Gelman was uh, uh, blocked uh, to give a talk at the Collège de France because the physics graduate uh, students wanted that he explained why he was supporting the Vietnam War before talking about particle physics. You may have an idea. So it was the year of the strike, research strike in, at the MIT. Now, I jump into my, I have less than, but just a, a detail. Uh, I, had here, I have here this, uh, 
This interview with Toroldo de Francia, who was the president of the Italian Physical Society at the time. And I like very much because he says something that uh, he saved the Italian Physical Society because uh, uh, the Italian risk had been split in two at the time. Uh, and he used this kind of uh, denomination I, I like very much. Uh, I had my old teachers who were not fascist, not at all, but certainly reactionary. And the young people who were pro-communist, but too much. Uh, and uh, Toral de Francia said, we need to do both. We need to do particle research, as has been done, but I'll take care of our needs of the society, which particles don't do, but I could do. Uh, it's nice to see that the same context uh, which motivated the Italian Physical Society to dedicate the, this school uh, to foundations of quantum mechanics, the same decision uh, it was taken to uh, dedicate the Two years later, uh, the same school, Varena, the prestigious Enrico Fermi School, to uh, history of physics in the 20th century and society, something like that. So we are part of a field here, uh, historians of physics, who we were, in a certain sense, uh, benefited uh, uh, from this uh, kind of uh, changes. I am moving for my uh, final words. Now, uh, on the other side uh, uh, of the Atlantic, similar trends were operating. Uh, I want just to, to, to say that Physics Today and American Journal of Physics, uh, they played a role opening the debate about the interpretations of quantum mechanics. I'm not very interested in the American Journal of Physics, but I'm very interested in the case of Physics Today. Because Physics Today, it, it was at the time uh, on, on a dispute uh, uh, reflecting the dispute uh, among American physicists, a part of them wanted the American Physical Society took position against the Vietnam War. And the other, posi and the other majority uh, wanted that the American Physical Society should not take uh, this position. This was a clash uh, among uh, physicists, American physicists. And physics today did not publish the letters uh, pressing the community to take position. Uh, the editor uh, of the time just uh, uh, took the letters. But at the same year, he took this decision to editorialize a debate about the foundations of quantum mechanics. Then he accepted uh, Bryce DeWitt's idea of publishing a nice paper about uh, quantum mechanics and the reality. And there were uh, a sequence uh, of uh, letters and the articles uh, supporting different views uh, of, of interpretations on quantum mechanics. One of these letters I like very much uh, because he, the letter was written by Michael Hammett or somebody who went to, to uh, medical physical, uh, use of physics in medicine. And he said this, there was a, uh, the very interesting contribution to the quantum mechanics debate in your April issue and the paper by DeWitt, which triggered uh, uh, them, as they exemplify the highly complex and subtle ways in which scientific opinion can change. I think that this is a very sociological diagnostic, very precise. And he said, 20 years ago, uh, the Copenhagen line was scientific, and anything else was meaningless, mumbo-jumbo, and at the best mistake. And now, the curious thing is that, as far as I am aware, there was no major finding or theoretical insight that could be held to demolish or supersede this interpretation. This is not very right, because you had uh, work, theoretical work uh, on, on the field. No? But he said, nevertheless, there is now considerable satisfaction with the Copenhagen interpretation and a willingness to regard other point of views. Now, here is where I jump. Uh, this part, uh, because David talked very well, but I want to, because it's true that uh, I would say that uh, David's books uh, may be read as this, uh, uh, how an important theorem in quantum information was uh, motivated by the work done by uh, this kind of California and the New Age physicists, etc. 
But it is also true, and this is your, in your book, uh, that uh, a physicist like John Clauser, uh, he was supported by this environment, this uh, uh, social environment, uh, uh, the same uh, at the same time, so he was part of the, the, the physic, uh, physics group, in a time that he had problems to get a job in the American academia. So uh, if you don't want to, to share uh, his views about uh, New Age and so on, uh, he had a kind of sociability. Uh, among these physicists. It's not by chance that he said this, that it was only 1976 when the uh, people who work on quantum foundations uh, went out of the closet. Because he was very isolated uh, in the early 70s. He didn't go to the Varena conference. There was no conference in 19, uh, between 1970 and 1976. So the people he was dealing with, it was Shimon, uh, Shimon Holt, uh, and these guys. Uh, and uh, Klaus had this view uh, about uh, quantum mechanics, uh, where he uh, related uh, the spirit of the time against the Vietnam War and uh, uh, his work on quantum foundations. Now, let me jump to my conclusions. Two conclusions, very... Uh, <coughs> Uh, very short conclusion because my time is, is run. Uh, what I call the rules of history. Uh, so, uh, the quantum dissidents uh, won in the sense that foundations became a, resp uh, a prestige uh, team in physics. But uh, they had higher expectations. They wanted to uh, expose the limits of quantum mechanics, or to use uh, close rules, to check the world, to check quantum mechanics. Uh, as late as 1980s, John Bell uh, used to say that quantum mechanics is rotten, this famous uh, reference to Hamlet, which was an oblique reference to Niels Bohr. Uh, now, what is the irony of the history is that trying to attack the foundation of quantum mechanics, the quantum incidents ended up consolidating and developing quantum mechanics itself. And the quantum theory entered the 21st century as vindicated as ever. I think that this is a lesson from history uh, which may lead us to reflect about science, how, how science reflects. So these guys wanted to check quantum mechanics. In the end of the day, they did not check quantum mechanics. And the second and last conclusion, uh, more explicit, I asked me if there is any lesson from this history or story for physics. I think that the only conclusion or, or at least the more important conclusion is not the details of the conceptual issues, technical issues, philosophical issues. My main conclusion from this history of physics for physics is that uh, we, physicists, we need more tolerance with opposite views when engaging in scientific controls, particularly when conceptual issues are at stake. Because conceptual issues are like ghosts. They always come back to haunt us if we do, if we do not face them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. So we have now about half an hour for questions for both for the whole tandem for both of the morning talks and. Um, uh, uh, thank you, that was very interesting. The, uh, I, uh, just in relation to uh, the very end there, I always uh, tell my students when we, we talk about uh, Bell's theorem, I say, you know, Bell's theorem is probably the most tested, uh, you know, experimental result in scientific history. You know, people are always doing Bell's experiment over and over again. 
And uh, the reason, I say, it's like, uh, you know, it, you know it, it's in a way it's a test of uh, Einstein's belief in reality and so on. And I say that uh, it's because it really strikes a chord in, in people and, and uh, very strong. And I say it's like the fact that, uh, you know, if... Uh, you know, if you have a vampire that's been running around and you're told, uh, you're told, you know, that the, the way you kill a vampire is to stab him with a silver knife at, mo at midnight, you know. And uh, so I say even, you know, if the full moon, during a full moon, if the full moon comes and you see the vampire and you stab him, you know, and you bury him, and you're still afraid of him because <laughs> because it's it's such a fearsome possibility that, uh, that no matter how many times you kill him, you're you're always afraid of him. I need to face and, and it. I, I think that that's that's why people keep doing these uh, Bell experiments because even though they they may believe in quantum mechanics, that it's still at some very deep level, Bob Bob's. Very good. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for, for this insightful talk and for the advertisement of my modest work. <laughs> the, no, I have a comment to, related to, to what you were saying, which I think is pertinent to, to this meeting here and, and uh, a question. So the comment is, is about the Varenna School of 1972 in, in, in Italy, about the history of, of, uh, of physics and, and society. And I wanted to say that this school was laid the foundations for uh, engage, uh, professional engagement of young physicists in the, into the research of the history of physics, which led to the foundation of the CISFA, Italian Society for, for the History of Physics and Astronomy, and eventually for the activation of the curriculum of history of physics within the physics department in Italy at the end of the 70s as the, one of the, of the disciplinary sectors of, of uh, physics within, so the didactics, didactics and, and history of physics became an actual field uh, where you could hire uh, professors in the Italian university in physics department. So meetings of that kind, the sensitizing the physics towards the, the historical problems that actually, this is, this is a, a nice historical instance where uh, this professionalized some physicists to go into the, the history of physics and engage with the professional historians uh, and keep these uh, within the, so what, what we were mentioning yesterday the, in the panel discussion, how would you, how would you feel to have an historian in, in the physics department after, after this, uh, this story happened, and now it's fading. So in Italy, basically, there, are, there is one, one single person who is now habilitated to, to, be, uh, to have this, this role of a physicist with the historian affiliation in the physics department, but there are no positions open anymore. I think there are a few retired professors in Rome are left. And the question was instead about the um, Everett, uh, a relative state interpretation, where you you mentioned that so you you, per, you pose the the question is um, is usually not related to the to a result of the quantum measurement problem, but you can see it like that. And if you could elaborate on this, because in my opinion, is exactly I mean, is the only motivation for the relative state interpretation. Why, why did you say that this was a, one can also be seen like this? So what was in your opinion the main the main motivation, if not the solution to the quantum measurement problem. Uh, okay. Uh, first, let, let me make a comment <coughs> about the 1972 school, uh, Varenne School on History of Physics. Uh, I can see now, just now, when you remember this, uh, some, uh, some analogies with the event we are uh, having, uh, holding today. Uh, in the sense that uh, even if the 
title of the school, which was History of Physics and Society, but you had over there a number of physicists and historians of physics uh, working together. Dirac, uh, Dirac the, the, the most well known, but it was not the only. Uh, then, uh, if you want to trace uh, 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 a distant origin uh, for the idea of this, this conference, the, the, this event, you, you can ima imagine uh, this kind of collaboration between physicists and uh, among physicists and historians of physics. Now, what I wanted to, to say about Everett is that uh, nowadays there are different arguments favorable to, 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 to Everett's interpretation. For instance, I, I, I'm not uh, saying which is more important. No doubt that solving the quantum measurement problem in a certain way is one of the attractive, but uh, some people also said that it's necessary for quantum uh, gravitation when you, abroad, when you approach uh, cosmology. And uh, David Dodge said that uh, this was very instrumental uh, when he was thinking about quantum computation. So nowadays you have different reasons uh, to uh, defend or to present the historical context uh, of Everett's interpretation. Now, what I wanted to emphasize is that when Everett uh, wrote his dissertation, you will not find in the dissertation, or maybe you, if you check now, I was so surprised that I want to check uh, Everett's uh, dissertation again. If the, the term uh, quantum measurements appears uh, in Everett's dissertation. But the motivation was over there. And the motivation was very highlighted when Everett was attacked by uh, people from Copenhagen, particularly uh, Rosenfeld, and when O. Peterson uh, related the, the criticism from, uh, from uh, people uh, at Copenhagen. Uh, there is a part, I, I'm not able to remember the exact words, but in this paper, uh, uh, Stefan, who, who wrote with me, and Fabio Freitas, uh, there is this sentence that uh, uh, Everett answered to Og Peters, saying that uh, in this country, what we know about quantum mechanics was taught by von Neumann. So I cannot understand what you are saying about uh, this role of, uh, and when I, uh, this role of language and classical concepts, etc. And when I understand, I am more against it. Uh, in, so, in this sense, that uh, uh, one of the strong motivations was uh, the solution of, the solution, so, so, the presentation of quantum mechanics done by von Neumann, just this. I like the way you said that um, there was nobody more supportive of the next generation than Abner Shimoni. Um, I thought I would, would add a piece of evidence to, to that with an anecdote. Um, so Abner and I certainly had our disagreements about where quantum mechanics should go. For instance, he was was rather strongly uh, wedded to the idea that the probabilities in quantum theory are objective probabilities or propensities. Um, and I, on the other hand, wanted to explore um, a Bayesian route, a, a subjective understanding of probabilities. And I think it was about in 2010, there was a meeting here in Vienna, and Abner gave a talk, and he recited a large piece of Edward Lear's poem, The Jumblies, and in the poem there was an emphasis, Abner emphasized a line where it, it said, uh, you're going, uh, we're going to see, we're going to see in a sieve, you know, a sieve is uh, uh, something that you drain water from the vegetables, mm. we're going to see in a sieve, so in other words, we're sinking, and as he read the poem, he looked straight into my eyes. <laughs> And, um, and then after the talk, he came up to me and he said, when I read uh, You're Going to See in a Sieve, I was thinking about you, Chris. 
<laughs> so we had our disagreements. Okay, well, um, fast forward to a, a few years later, we, or maybe just two or three years later, we had a conference at Perimeter Institute. Or I wasn't at Perimeter Institute yet. But there was a conference at Perimeter Institute in honor of Abner. And I, Abner and I were both taken with the early American pragmatist. Abner was, a, uh, he adored Charles Sanders Peirce. And Abner wrote me a letter once saying, I adore, you love William James. Chris, you love William James, but I adore Peirce. One of the distinctions between Peirce and James was that Peirce was more for an objective notion of probability and James was more for a subjective. <laughs> In any case, uh, I gave a talk, I was going to give a talk at, at this meeting <coughs> titled Peirce, James, and the Quantum Bayesians, and it was going to be about Peirce in honor of Abner. Um, so, two days before the meeting, I wrote to Abner saying that uh, since I didn't know much about Peirce, I was reading a biography of him. And I said, the more I read of it, the more I become depressed, noting all the similarities between his life and mine. I will see you in two days, Chris. And that's all I sent him. Uh, I got to the meeting. I didn't get to talk to Abner the first day. But the second day, he came up to me with a very grandfatherly, worried voice. And he said, Chris, are, are you okay? And I said, yes. He said, I didn't get a chance to talk to you yesterday, but, but I saw you from the distance, and I, I saw that you still have your wedding ring on, so your marriage must be okay, but are, are your children okay? <laughs> and I said, yes, my children are okay. What, what is the issue? He said, your life, you said, was so similar to Purse's. Well, Purse was um, a user of drugs. He was a womanizer. He lost all of his money because he lived a flamboyant lifestyle. And so I guess all of these things were going through Abner's head. But particularly, all I meant was that Charles Sanders Peirce was never able to get an academic position. And I, too, had immense trouble getting an academic position because even in my day, I was doing too much foundations, and that excluded me from hundreds of applications. Uh, no, I applied at hundreds of places. I, I was only accepted at one eventually. Um, so anyway, I, I said, oh, Abner, all I meant was I can't get an academic position. I mean, I, I can't get an academic And Abner's reaction was, oh, is that it? Is that all? When I go home, I will talk to my chairman and see if we can find a position for you at my university. So despite all of our differences on the foundations of quantum mechanics, he made a genuine effort to get me into his faculty just because I was young and I needed a job. So I, I, I just um, remember that story of him. Chris also applied to my school. <laughs> I applied to David's school. Uh, I, I, I applied to the University of Vienna. Uh, uh, <laughs> I applied everywhere. I had tried for a long time, and I finally got the department to say that uh, a historian who and philosopher of quantum mechanics was a respectable physicist, and they were going to hire one. And Chris came along at the opportune time, and they listened to him. And they went ahead and hired a uh, solid-state physicist, because the department was its strongest in solid-state <laughs> physics. And the next one, uh, you know, I tried to get, and they, they all agreed, oh, yes, we need a, a, a scientist. But they, they hired a high-energy physicist. And to this day, they haven't hired a, uh, anybody in, 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 in that field. So, uh, and they never will unless lightning strikes. And uh, so a lot of universities, they feel, well, it would be nice, but uh, especially like at City College, we're having tremendous uh, 
problems keeping the state funding us and so on, and you don't have that much money and you don't have that many people you can hire, and you go to your strengths. And, uh, uh, and, and that's the way academia has probably always been, but certainly in lean times like these it is. And it, it, it's very hard to, to hire somebody who's not in, in one of the predominant, it, who's not in one of the overhired fields, you know. You can hire a string theorist even though the, the, you know, the evidence for string theory is far worse than, uh, than uh, any, any, anything that, that's done by the historians of science. And, uh, uh, you know, that's the way academia is, very unfortunate. Uh, let me make a, a short comment. Uh, I, I think that it was very appropriate uh, that you emphasize this role of Abner. Everybody here who had the chance to uh, interact with him uh, could have similar stories uh, about how he was interested in, in, in supporting people uh, as human uh, being. But I, I want to say that uh, if you also see uh, uh, some of the roles he, he played uh, in the debates of, of quantum uh, foundations, uh, the same pattern you will find. Uh, for instance, he organized these epistemological letters, uh, which was a kind of a very informal uh, a vehicle for circulating ideas uh, in the 70s, and he, he was the editor of the epistemological letters. Uh, the, the, the vehicle was uh, published in Swiss, Switzerland, but the real editor was him. So he, he, he used part of his time uh, for editing a vehicle which was not official vehicle, but he, he understood that this was important to the debate uh, on foundations of quantum mechanics. And some very important debates uh, on foundations of quantum mechanics in the 70s, you cannot find in any journal except in uh, 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 the epistemological letters, which are now uh, deposited at Pittsburgh uh, University. But I also think that he was, uh, I don't know if he was influenced by Eugene Wigner in this sense, but I would say that they, they, uh, Abner and Eugene Wigner had different views about a number of subjects, for instance, politics, uh, Vietnam War, and so, so on. But uh, towards the debates in science, they were very, very tuned uh, with the other. Uh, and uh, I cited this case of Wigner, but if Wigner opened the, the 1970 Varena School, and it, uh, his piece over there, I think that it's an example uh, of uh, open, uh, open mind to the, when you have a scientific controversy. Because he presented five or six different solutions for the measurement problem, he presented the weakness and the strong points of each one. And in the end, he defended his own view. But before defending his own view, Wigner presented uh, in a very honest, in a very fair manner, uh, all the alternatives uh, which were on the table. Uh, and the opposite character, <laughs> uh, if you compare it with Wigner, who, it was a physicist from the same generation, uh, Leon Rosenfeld who was, in this sense, a, 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 a person who, who did not help too much uh, to open the intellectual space uh, in physics uh, to the research on foundations of quantum mechanics. Okay, maybe I take the last question then. Um, speaking of Leon Rosenfeld, um, so as it seems, he was not an uh, not a fan of quantum foundations, but um, what still it's not quantum foundation, but he did uh, make one of the earliest contributions to quantum <laughs> gravity, um, which he is, if I know correctly, later distances himself a little bit from. So I was wondering if this distancing from his early 
comp contributions to quantum gravity and his um, um, opposing view to quantum foundations is correlated, or is this a different issue? Uh, I can make first uh, uh, an advertisement. We have now a wonderful biography of Rosenfeld, written by Anja uh, uh, Jakobsen. Uh, where the evolution uh, of Rosenfeld uh, may be uh, spotted. Uh, he was a very complex uh, character in the sense that he himself was engaged in the foundation of quantum mechanics. He wrote this uh, paper with Bohr in the, in the third. Uh, it's true that in that context, it was a, a, a different context uh, from the, 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 the 50 so it was uh, him and Bohr uh, defending against uh, Landau's uh, uh, and uh, criticism to, 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 to the possibility uh, of having a consistent uh, quantum electrodynamics. Uh, and uh, he spent time uh, writing what he saw as the, the final solution for uh, quantum foundations which were the epistemological lessons from quantum mechanics, as you said. So you see, he, he, he himself, he dedicated to this subject. But I would say that from a certain time, and from my point of view, it was exactly after the World War II, because Rosenfeld was uh, a very committed uh, Marxist, and uh, this kind uh, of uh, debates and battles among Marxists were like a, a religious battle. So he was against the Soviets, against the Stalin, uh, and uh, he was pro war And he simply could not accept the idea that the, these uh, Soviet physicists uh, or Marxist physicists like Fock, like Bonn, were criticizing uh, Bonn. Then, from that moment on, he acted in a very dogmatic manner. So uh, this Rosenfeld, very dogmatic, very uh, uh, resistant to, 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 the, to the open debate, uh, this, uh, for me, it's clear from the, uh, after the World War II, 1947, 48. For instance, uh, in the, the biography and the, also in my book, The Quantum Incidents, there are evidences that before the appearance uh, of the uh, paper by Bonn, 1952, Rosenfeld wrote to, 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 to Bohr, reporting to Bohr uh, the kind of battle uh, happening in Soviet, Soviet Union, in the Soviet Union, uh, on quantum mechanics, and criticizing these uh, uh, guys. Uh, and uh, furthermore, uh, he, he advised uh, the editor of Nature to not publish a paper by Frankel, uh, who was, in a certain sense, critics, uh, 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 there were criticism uh, towards uh, the, the news board thought. So uh, the, 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 the complexity uh, of Rosenfeld character, you needed to, to take at least these two or three uh, parts. Uh, he was very uncomfortable with the trends in the Soviet Union, philosophical trends on one hand. Uh, he was very convinced that Bohr uh, thought were the epistemological lessons from uh, quantum mechanics. And uh, uh, he tried to, 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 to to sell a, a, a story that there was no important question being debated, being investigated by David Bohm, by Hugh Everett. So it, 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 this is the late Rosenfeld. I think that in a certain sense it's different from the uh, Rosenfeld in the 1930s. But he was a very complex man. And he was a, a good historian of physics. Uh, he, he supported the, the initiatives of UNESCO uh, to, 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 to publish a, a number. And if you see his collected works, a number of papers are, are, are about the history of science, and they are good, good papers. So he was a physicist and a historian of physics, but a very dogmatic man, a person from the 50s on. Thank you very much. Thanks again for
both of the speakers of the morning, and we will have lunch now until 2, so have a good lunch and see you at 2.